Hello and welcome. Today I want to talk about the topics of national differences in political, economic, and legal systems that exist in today's global world that you and I deal with on a regular basis. The political economy basically is inclusive of the political, economic, and legal systems of any country uh, that uh, basically guides our behaviors, our laws, and our policies every single day. These systems are somewhat interdependent. So the political, the economic, and the legal systems are interdependent. They support each other and they influence each other on a regular basis. So therefore we must all develop a really good awareness as well as appreciation of the significance of country differences in political systems and economic systems and legal systems and in economic development and even the societal culture. As international managers and global managers in general, we should be able to describe how the political, the economic, and the legal, and the cultural systems of many of the world's different nation states are somewhat evolving and to draw out the implications of these changes for the practice of international business uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. The political systems of government in any nation is called the political system. So the way the government operates in any country or nation is called the political systems. It is often assessed according to two different dimensions. One would be collectivism and the other one would be individualism, as well as on the degree to which they are either democratic or totalitarian. So again, whether you're democratic or totalitarian might be on extremes. So some countries can be somewhere in between or have a mix of the two uh, formats or regimes. So these dimensions are interrelated. The systems that emphasize collectivism tend to lean toward totalitarianism. Whereas those that place a high value on individualism tend to be more democratic or lean toward democratic uh, systems. However, there is a large gray area that exists in the middle uh, because countries might be transitioning from one system to the other and it might take sometimes decades and decades uh, to transition. In general, again, collectivism emphasizes collective goals over individual goals. There's also in terms of political systems, uh, an element of socialism here. Socialism is the public ownership of the means of production for the common good. In the early years of the 20th century, the socialist ideology somewhat split into two broad camps of communism and social democrats. So the communists believed that socialism could be achieved only through violent revolution and totalitarian dictatorship, whereas the social democrats committed themselves to achieving socialism through democratic means, turning their backs on violent revolution and dictatorships. Both versions of socialism somewhat polished and also decreased during the 20th century. On the other hand, sometimes you can have a privatization system. So privatization is the sale of state-owned enterprises to private investors. Many of the former Soviet Union countries during the 1990s actually transitioned through privatization of state-owned enterprises. Then you can have individualism as opposed to collectivism. So individualism is where an individual should have freedom in economic and political pursuits. In this case, the interests of the individual usually takes precedence over the interests of the government or the state. There are two beliefs here. In other words, in individualism, you guarantee individual freedom and self-expression. And second, we believe that the welfare of society can be best served by letting people pursue 
their own economic interests. So in other words, the richer an entrepreneur becomes because of his or her innovation, the more likely that he or she will continue to be innovative and serve society through more innovations. And others would say, okay, uh, I can personally benefit by innovating or coming up with new ideas or serving a market. Therefore, I'll do everything I can to do that because ultimately most of the benefit will come uh, to me. But in the meantime, obviously uh, people who are served by that um, service uh, are benefiting and also the government benefits because they collect taxes from the entrepreneur. So the central message of individualism is that individual economic and political freedoms are the ground rules on which a society should be based on. This puts individualism in conflict with collectivism though, where collectivism asserts the primacy of the collective over the individual. Individualism actually asserts the opposite, right? So when it comes to democracy versus totalitarianism, we know that in a democratic environment, government is for the people and by the people, often exercised through direct or through elected representatives in society. In totalitarianism, one person or one political party exercises absolute control over all spheres of human life and prohibits opposing political parties. Democracy and individualism somewhat go hand in hand as do the communist version of collectivism in totalitarianism. In a totalitarian country, all of the constitutional guarantees on which representative democracies are built, such as an individual's right to freedom of expression and organization, a free media in regular elections, are denied to the ordinary citizens. So again, that is in a totalitarian country or environment. In most totalitarian states, countries, or nations, political repression is widespread. Free and fair elections are often lacking. Media are heavily censored. Basic human liberties are denied. And those who actually question the rights of the rulers to rule tend to find themselves in prison or sometimes dead. In democracy, we have representative democracy where citizens periodically elect individuals to represent them as we do here in the United States uh, every two years uh, for local elections and then sometimes every four years for national elections. Democracy can include a multitude of safeguards that are typically based on constitutional law, which can include freedom of expression, freedom of media, and fair court systems for all citizens. In most modern democratic states, uh, they tend to practice representative democracy. Totalitarianism can have many different forms. So communist totalitarianism is where socialism can be achieved only through a totalitarian dictatorship. And theocratic totalitarianism is monopolized by a party, by a group, or an individual which governs according to religious principles. Tribal totalitarianism is where you have a party, a group, or individual that represents the interests of a particular tribe, which monopolizes political power in the country or in the state. And then you have right-wing totalitarianism, which generally permits individual economic freedom. However, they restrict individual political freedom, including free speech, on the ground that it would lead to the rise of communism. So right-wing totalitarianism is different from tribal, theocratic, or communist forms of totalitarianism. You also have what we know as pseudo-democracies. So they lie somewhere between pure democracies and complete totalitarian systems. So in pseudo-democracies, authoritarian groups or elements would have captured some or much of the machinery of state and use this to deny basic political and civil liberties to the citizens living there.
Let us now talk a little bit about economic systems that we might experience in a global uh, marketplace. So generally, there are three different types of economic systems. You have market economy, command economy, and a mixed economy. A market economy is where all productive activities are privately owned. Production is determined by supply and demand driven by the market. And for the market economy to work, supply must not be restricted by any form of authority. And the role of government should be to encourage vigorous, free, as well as fair competition among all entrepreneurs, among all competitors or industries in the market. The command economy is where government plans the goods and services, the quantity and price, and then allocates them for the good of society. In a command economy, all businesses are state owned. Historically, they are found in communist countries and there are no incentives for individuals to look for better ways to serve people's needs in a command economy because they're not getting any uh, benefit for themselves or for their families or for their own community, is for the collective community. And obviously as determined by the government for the good of society overall. So in a command economy, while the objective of it is to mobilize economic resources for the public good. Unfortunately, the opposite usually seems to be happening. In a command economy, state-owned enterprises have little incentive to control cost and be efficient because they cannot go out of business. So if you need more money, you just ask the top uh, echelons to give it to you. And if the money is there, obviously you get it. So there's no incentive to make things more efficiently. Finally, there are many nations who belong to a mixed economy system. So in the mixed economy, some sectors are privately owned and some are government owned. The mixed economy was once common in the developed world. However, it is less common uh, now. Government can aid trouble firms whose operations are vital to national interests. So sometimes market-driven economy can become a mixed economy in a given time to save certain large corporations from going bankrupt, which is not in the interest of the total uh, society in general. For example, in the United States during 2008 and 2009 uh, recession, the American government helped companies like Citigroup, General Motors, and others so they don't go out of business. Uh, this way they can employ thousands and thousands of people. At the meantime, those people do not become dependent on the government due to unemployment. So in some mixed economies, such as China, the state uses its control of state-owned enterprises to further its industrial policy, to promote the development of public and private sectors that it believes to be important for the future economic development of the country or society in that nation in general. Let us now talk a little bit about legal systems, which refer to the rules or laws that regulate people's behavior in a given environment. Legal systems are processes through which laws are enforced. They're processes through which redress for grievances obtained. Legal systems are usually influenced by the prevailing political system that is in place in any nation or uh, state. The legal system of a country is of immense importance to any form of international business in today's global environment. A country's laws regulate business practice, they define the manner in which business transactions are to be executed, and they set down the rights and obligations of those who are involved in business transactions across nation uh, or the country. So the legal environments of countries do differ in significant ways that international managers need to be aware of. Different legal systems can be inclusive of common law practices, civil law practices, and theocratic law practices. So common law evolved in England over hundreds of years ago. It's based on tradition, precedent, and customs. 
and it's more flexible than uh, the other systems that exist right now. And the civil law is based on detailed laws that are organized into specific codes. Civil law is less adversarial than a common law system. And then you have theocratic law, which is based on religious teachings, and it's most common in countries that practice Islamic beliefs, such as uh, United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, uh, where people have a tendency to practice religion in all of their transactions across the government, private sector, and public sector. Common law, which is based on tradition, based on precedent, based on customs, is actually now found in most uh, uh, places, uh, such as the Great Britain's former colonies, uh, which includes the United States. So we practice common law here. And now, tradition refers to the country's legal history, and precedent uh, refers to the cases that have come before the court in the past. That's why we say that that uh, judges usually rely on precedents in the past. However, that's not always the case because judges also make their own decisions based on circumstantial evidence and situational variables. And customs refers to the ways in which laws are applied in a specific situation. So when law courts interpret common law, they do so with regard to these characteristics of tradition, precedent, and custom in a common law environment. It gives common law system a degree of flexibility that other systems actually lack. Currently, we know that more than 80 countries, including places like Germany, France, Japan, and Russia, operate based on a civil law system. So a civil law system tends to be less adversarial, as I mentioned earlier, than a common law system because the judges rely on detailed legal codes rather than interpreting tradition, precedent, and customs. On the other hand, theocratic law, and more specifically Islamic law, is primarily a moral rather than a commercial law, which is intended to govern all aspects of a person's life, both in the private and public sectors. There are some differences in contract law that we need to be aware of as global managers or international uh, professionals. First of all, a contract specifies conditions under which an exchange is to occur, and it tends to detail rights of parties involved in a contract. Contract law is a body of law that governs contract enforcement. Under the common law system, contracts are very detailed with all contingencies spelled out word for word or sentence by sentence. They are more expensive and can be adversarial. On the other hand, under the civil law, contracts tend to be much shorter and not as specific as they would be under the common law system. With regards to legal systems, we should also be aware of the United Nations Convention on Contracts for International Sale of Goods, otherwise known as CISG. The CISG establishes a uniform set of rules which govern certain aspects of the making and performance of everyday commercial contracts between sellers and buyers who have their places of business in different countries. CISG applies automatically to all contracts for the sale of goods between different firms based in countries that have ratified the convention unless the parties opt out. Countries differ in the extent to which their legal systems actually define and protect property rights. However, almost all countries now have laws on their books that protect property rights. So property can be any resource that a person or a business owns. And sometimes we have intellectual property rights where a company owns an innovation or creates something new based on their research, based on their knowledge, based on their experimentation.
legal systems are also associated with corruption, right? There is economic evidence which suggests that high levels of corruption significantly reduce foreign direct investment, level of international trade and economic growth in a country. So be mindful that when a country has high levels of corruption, less people will invest into that country and the level of international trade and the economic growth in the country, unfortunately, will suffer as a result. Transparency International provides regular data on the ranking of corruption by country. If we look at the year 2020, um, it shows that there are some countries that are considered to be highly corrupt based on ranking, based on ratings, based on surveys, based on data that they collect from individuals doing business in each country. So for example, Somalia right now is considered to be one of the countries uh, where it is highly corrupt or the business practices require a lot of um, bribery or corrupt uh, acts. Similarly, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Nigeria are also falling in those categories of highly corrupt business practice environments. However, there are other countries like New Zealand, Sweden, which are rated to be um, highly clean countries. In summary, let me emphasize that as global managers and professionals in your fields, you need to understand the pros and cons of globalization, the principles of international trade, as well as the skills that are needed to effectively manage every department, every operation toward win-win outcomes for all relevant stakeholders. You can do it. Good luck.